Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good evening and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Renee Saidi, this evening's moderator. Non-members in the audience are cordially invited to join the Commonwealth Club. You'll find membership and program information at the website www.commonwealthclub.org. We are muting our guests, but not our panelists. We have reserved some time for questions at the end of this program. As your questions come to you, we encourage you to use the chat function to send it to us throughout this evening, as we'll be moderating the Q&A for our panelists. A Commonwealth Club tradition is to start with the sound of three gavels. So I'll clap my hands three times to officially start this virtual event. <coughs> to introduce myself, I'm Renee Saidi, and it is my distinct honor to moderate tonight's important discussion. I come to you with a deep-rooted passion for social justice, especially human rights and equity for women and girls. I currently serve as the Champions for Equality Program Manager at Global Fund for Women, where I've worked for over nine years. In this position, I work closely with cohorts of philanthropists, leading programming on feminist philanthropy and partnering with grassroots activists in an immersive learning and travel opportunity, Champions for Equality. Before we meet our panelists, we want to start with a question for our audience. Please use your YouTube chat to put in your answer. How frequently is a girl married against her will? every two seconds, every two minutes, every two hours, or every two days. Thank you for your answers coming in. You may be surprised that currently a girl is married against her will every two seconds. Before COVID, with significant work from organizations like those here today, the frequency declined to one girl married every three seconds. But COVID-19 has exacerbated this already massive problem. And unfortunately, we are now seeing rates of a girl being married every two seconds again. Every two seconds. It's hard to even wrap our heads around this number that is depriving girls of their childhoods, their bodily integrity, individual choice, and the chance of freedom in education. We are so grateful to all of you who have joined us to learn more about this issue. Our topic tonight, ending child marriage can seem daunting. I think we all can agree this practice is unconscionable and yet it persists around the world in our own country and as we will discuss tonight in Nepal. If child marriage were so easy to end, we would have done it by now. So what does change really take? At Global Fund for Women, a tool we've used to better understand complex change is a change matrix. From the informal to the formal on one axis and the individual to systemic on the other. As we'll discuss tonight, there is no one singular way to make change. There is no single silver bullet. The solution to ending child marriage is not simply increasing a girl's individual awareness or making sure that a girl's family knows that the practice isn't right. Or on the formal side, it's not just offering people services and opportunities or and alternatives. It also isn't just forming law, changing laws and policies on the formal side to raise the minimum age of marriage or implementing those laws and policies and changing social norms in communities. Especially in these complex issues, true systemic change takes time and many varied strategies and actions in concert. 
our esteemed panelists this evening work across that matrix to make up a tapestry of change toward a brighter future for Nepali girls. First, I'm pleased to introduce Sangeeta Lama, who is joining us tonight from Nepal, where it is morning. Thank you, Sangeeta. Sangeeta brings an international awareness to this issue and many important issues facing Nepali communities. As an independent Nepali journalist with more than 20 years of experience and publications in, in sources like National Geographic and the New York Times, Sangeeta actively supports women and girls and the issues faced by marginalized people. She strengthens women's rights in Nepal as the senior vice chair of Sankalpa, Women's Alliance for Peace, Justice, and Democracy, and has collaborated with our fellow panelist, Stephanie Sinclair, and Too Young to Wed for the past 15 years to support families in Kanguti village. Increasing the individual and community level awareness of the issue, shifting cultural norms, and offering access to resources and services. Our second panelist is Stephanie Sinclair. Stephanie is the founding executive director of Too Young to Wet, a nonprofit dedicated to abolishing child marriage by working at the individual and systemic levels to change social norms and practices. By partnering with local communities, she and Too Young to Wed provide access to resources and services to keep girls in school and to increase their awareness of the risks of early enforced marriages and suggest culturally appropriate alternatives. Stephanie is also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist known for gaining unique access and attention to the most sensitive gender and human rights issues around the world. She regularly publishes in esteemed outlets, including National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine. Through her work, Stephanie portrays the lives of vulnerable girls subjected to practices such as child marriage, genital mutilation, and acid attacks with dignity, depth, and empathy. Her ongoing series, Too Young to Wed, delves into how child marriage has altered the fate of tens of thousands of young girls. Our third panelist is Olga Murray. Olga has been at the forefront of change across the board throughout her life. Born in 1925 in Transylvania, Olga immigrated to the U.S. with her parents and in 1954 became one of the first women to graduate with a law degree from Washington, George Washington University. During her 37-year tenure at the California Supreme Court, Olga helped write important decisions in the areas of civil rights, women's rights, and environmental policy. Olga currently serves as the founder and honorary president of the Nepal Youth Foundation, an organization she founded in 1990 to help provide health, shelter, education, and freedom to children and families in Nepal. Notably, NYF helped eradicate the inhumane practice of indenturing little girls as kitchen servants. And our final panelist is Lori Barra. Lori is a passionate supporter of women and girls around the world. She's the executive director of the Isabel Allende Foundation, a private family foundation whose mi mission is to invest in the power of women and girls to secure reproductive rights, economic independence, and freedom from violence. In this role, Lori is a true funder partner creating deep relationships with activists and nonprofits to increase their funding, organizational capacities, and support them in bringing about the change they seek to make. Prior to leading the foundation, Lori designed books and magazines in New York and Tokyo and worked, as an Apple, worked for Apple as an art director. We hope that by the end of this hour, and with these incredible panelists, you will have an understanding of the critical importance of girls' freedom for, for families and communities in Nepal, and what you can do to help end this unjust and inequitable practice. So without further ado, I'd like to start by turning to Sangeeta. Sangeeta, would you please give us your insight into the historical and local context of child marriage in Nepal? Thank you very much, Rani, <clears throat> and thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the program. 
um, I have jotted down a few notes, few lines. So I will use, I'll be using my PowerPoint as well. Uh, I, my talk will be based on the report I went through, uh, Human Rights Watch, and basically I referred uh, Human Rights Watch reports and UNICEF, as well as I talked to a friend, a journalist friend who, uh, who has been writing on this issue for a long time. Uh, okay, so now I'll, I will start. Mm. Uh, child marriage still remains a common practice in Nepal. Uh, child marriage occurs more frequently among girls who are the least educated, poorest, and living in rural areas. Uh, children from Dalit, Janajati, and the other marginalized communities are more vulnerable to child marriages. Poverty, the low value attached to daughters, lack of access to education are the main contributing factors to child marriages. While the caste system, patriarchal culture and political instability also play a role to this. Child marriages are never registered. Many children in Nepal are still being married off before 18, despite the government announcing in 2014, a target to eradicate child marriage by 2030. According to a Human Rights Watch report, 37% of girls in Nepal are married before 18. In Kagati village, where we have been working, where Stephanie and I have been working for 15 years, uh, child marriage went up 71% for girls in 2020 compared to the year before due to the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, Nepal has the third highest rate of child marriage in Asia after Bangladesh and India. According to UNICEF, Nepal ranked 17th among countries in the world with a high prevalence of child marriage. Uh, married girls usually drop out of school and have babies early, often jeopardizing their health and that of their children. They are also more likely to be victims of domestic violence. A UNICEF study found that one in three married girls in Nepal had been subjected to sexual violence by their husbands, while one in six reported physical violence. Most of the child marriages are arranged by parents. Peer pressure also plays a big role in making decisions to get married at early age. Uh, because sexual expression and pregnancy outside marriage are still not socially accepted. As a result, sexual active, sexually active girls who fear getting pregnant rush into marriages or elop, as they see it as the only option. Uh, the 2015 earthquake, earthquake uh, not only killed about 10,000 people and made millions homeless, but also increased the rate of child marriages. Families in the earthquake hit areas like uh, Kagati Villas uh, want to marry off their daughters so they have one less mouth to feed. Similarly, COVID-19 also hit across the country uh, for the last two years and closing the schools. Children have more time and parents also want them to marry off. Uh, for example, uh, I took an example uh, of an article that was published in the newspaper called Nepali Times, uh, Kathmandu-based English newspaper. According to an article, 30, ch 30 child marriages took place in one municipality in Sarlai district during the lockdown earlier this year. The lockdown also became an incentive to some families as they would as they could easily settle marriage rituals of girls between 16 to 18 with low budgets. Tough, uh, though, child marriage, though child marriage has been illegal in Nepal since uh, 1963, and arranging a child marriage is also punishable by law. And, but violet, and violators can jail for three years and fine 10,000 rupees, but the laws, the policies, and the strategy are only strong on paper. 
they are not properly enforced and implemented. Police and authorities give least priority to child marriage cases because it is socially acceptable for them as well. And they have many more other issues to deal with too. Ending child marriage is a target under Sustainable Development Goals 5.3 and 16.2. Uh, in 2016, the Nepal government endorsed a national strategy to end child marriage in Nepal by 2030. Uh, few national and international NGOs like Too Young to Wed are working to end child marriage and helping the government to achieve the 2030 SDG goal through awareness, training, and scholarship programs in Nepal. As uh, Too Young to Wed has been continuously providing scholarships to the poorest boys and girls from Kagati village for the last five years. And we hope that this program, this scholarship also helped to some extent to delay the child marriages in the village. The teachers, are, the teachers at the school tell us that if they hadn't get, the children hadn't get the scholarships, they would have dropped out from the school. Uh, and, at the end, uh, investing in girls, developing their social and economic assets, giving them access to education and health services, and ensuring that they can postpone marriage until they are ready means greater dignity for women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. I'd like to turn to Stephanie. Stephanie, you've been working on the issue of child marriage for decades now. Um, Please share your perspective on the lived reality for these young girls. Thank you, Renee. Um, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, it's, it's been, I've had the, the fortune and misfortune in some ways of being, you know, being able to be close to these girls for so many years, but also being there for some of their more difficult times. And the lived reality is, that they are, you know, some of them are lucky and they end up with a younger husband or they end up with, you know, somebody, you know, especially where the, where the boys are younger, where they can grow into at least being partners. But so many of the girls um, also, you know, more than, I would say more than, more often than not, they don't end up in those situations and they are end up in for sexual relations as children, they end up uh, giving birth before their before their bodies are ready. You know, if a girl gives birth before the age of fifteen, she's five times more likely to die during childbirth. She, um, we're seeing girls who almost all the girls that uh, I've met and stayed in touch with over the years have um, tried to. You know, many have, have have thought about trying to end their pregnancy. They've done it through unsafe ways. Um, many of them have had complications during birth, um, hemorrhaging, and, and then they just stay in the cycle of poverty. And, you know, the girls who have gotten out of this situation and are able to um, have another opportunity, that, that practice in their family stops with them. And then they don't end up marrying off their daughters early. And so it's been, it's a, it's a very, it's a painful reality. And, um, and I'm just grateful for panels like this and on all these organizations who are taking this issue so seriously. Thank you, Stephanie. I believe you had a video you wanted to share. Yes. Um, so Sangeeta and I worked in Kagati village. And uh, we, like I said, we've been working there for a very long time. And after the earthquake, we wanted to, we spoke to the village uh, elders and we wanted to show what was happening to girls um, you know, the increase of marriages after the earthquake. And so this is a piece, a small clip from a piece that ran in the in a New York Times series we have called Child Bride Mother. And this ran uh, not long after the earthquakes. Please take a look.
Oh, thank you so much for sharing that incredibly impactful story. And um, it's truly heartbreaking. Um, Stephanie, I, I wonder if you'd like to share any context for that before we move on. Um, I just, we wanted to share that because as you can see, even the father was crying. It's like, it becomes, and the family members, but you can see like one of the elder women says, you know, what are you doing differently that none of us have ever done? And, you know, I think that when the, when the cycle of poverty, you know, is kind of perpetuated like this and girls um, are, are facing such difficult, um, you know, they, they're taken out of school and all the, their lives change so rapidly, they're much, it's much harder for them to prevent this from happening to their own daughters. And so I just want to also take this moment to thank um, the families in the Kagati village for sharing their stories all of these years. Um, and they did it because they want change in their communities, they're open to change. And many of them are now champions on these issues. So um, I just wanted to just say, you know, just praise their courage and, and open heartedness in that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's, um, it's easy to share stories. Um, and I so appreciate the dignity with which you do that. And, um, and it's wonderful to hear that they are looking to change. Um, I, I'm Stephanie, I'll, I want to stay with you. Um, I, I imagine and I know that the past year has been uniquely challenging for all of us, but particularly in more marginalized communities. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your work and the impact of COVID-19 on the epidemic of childhood marriage? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, I mean, this has been such a difficult year and a half for everybody on the planet. And so many people have lost, lost loved ones and we've all just gone through such, you know, nobody's been unscathed in this. But I have to say that immediately, you know, after uh, COVID-19 started and the lockdown started, we started to see all of our beneficiaries in all the countries that, we're serve, that we serve um, girls in, go home, be, be sent to their homes. Some of them, uh, you know, close, when schools closed, in some countries where we work, uh, girls had run away from their marriages and had not yet been reconciled with their families. And so they were still on difficult terms. And so they were forced back into violent situations in some cases. And so it was extremely challenging. Um, you know, governments were working, you know, we, we had the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Gutierrez, immediately was saying that, you know, uh, girls and women were facing increased domestic violence. And, um, but it took so long for governments to start to prioritize what, what uh, girls were going through. And that really needs to be built into response, emergency responses. And this is an emergency. COVID is and was an emergency. And, and we studied for years that this should be, you know, that girls should be, um, programs protecting girls from violence should be built in from the beginning, not, an, not a, treated as an afterthought. And I read one statistic um, that uh, in conflict areas where there was uh, humanitarian assistance um, over a two year period, only 0.2% of uh, aid was given uh, to this, to this, uh, to, to helping girls. And so, and, and, and women from, you know, facing domestic violence and so and gender-based violence. And so I just think that, you know, we really have to, you know, double down and give more, uh, more, uh, priority to this. And they expect now that the rates of child marriage may, may go up, may 10 million more girls may be married over the next decade as a result. Whew. already high numbers and just getting higher. Um, thank you all for the work that you all do to, to lower that as much as we can. 
I'd like to turn to Olga. Um, Olga, you have been at the forefront of making change and supporting change at all levels throughout your life um, in the U.S. and in Nepal. I'd love for you to weigh in on the U.S. side of things and um, your experience in Nepal. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, before I turn to Nepal, I'd like to talk about the situation in the United States. <clears throat> It's pretty shocking, but you know that most states don't have a law against child marriage. It was really amazing to me that that's the truth. Uh, uh, so in Saudi Arabia, a minor girl can get married, uh, can't get married, but she can in California. Um, according to a rough estimate by the Pew Research Center, California has the sixth highest child marriage rate in the country. Uh, but this is just a rough estimate because nobody really knows. Um, believe it or not, there isn't even a record of the number of marriages of minors in California. A uh, bill was introduced in the legislature this year, not to end child marriage, mind you, but only to keep tabs on the number of such marriages. And as far as I know, it's still floating around in the ether somewhere in Sacramento. So here's a tiny step that you can take on the road to banning child marriage in California at least, contact your representative in Sacramento and ask him or her to get this law on the books. Uh, it's Assembly Bill 1286. Uh, it's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. So with that said, let's take a look at the uh, problem in Nepal. Um, NYF has been working to eradicate childhood marriages for years, using many of the techniques they developed for the Indentured Daughters Program. They launched a strong awareness campaign, created street plays to dramatize the problem, and made a concentrated effort to help parents recognize the value of their daughters and sons, especially the benefit of keeping them in school. So, uh, all the news we've heard so far has been sad and frustrating, but here is a bit of good news. Even in countries like Nepal, where child marriage is widespread and ingrained in the culture, it's possible to make inroads against it. Uh, our foundation has been working for 30 years in Nepal, and one of our major projects was to end the practice of bonding girls, some as young as six, uh, to work as an end to servants. When we rescued over 13,000 girls and brought them home to live with their families, uh, there was a real danger that their parents would marry them off to ease the burden of feeding them, which is why they were sent off in the first place. So we organized the liberated girls and provided them with training in advocacy. Uh, together, we created a program to prevent this from happening. We trained peer counselors who organized or orientation sessions with the daughters and their parents and teachers at the school about the harmful impact of early marriage. And we produced a weekly radio program and gave out pamphlets and trained peer counselors to provide individual counseling to the girls who were in danger of being married off. And because literacy, illiteracy was rife in the, these communities, the girls who had been previously liberated from servitude wrote plays, actually dramas, um, about the evils of child marriage, and they acted them out throughout the villages. Uh, since there's no electricity or TV in many of these communities, this was the only show in town, and so it was pretty well attended. Um, the returned girls from the returned girls were in every village and hamlet in the area. They knew which of their sisters was in danger of being married off, and they visited parents to urge them not to do so, often with one of the teachers from the school. But one of the most important things we did to prevent these girls from being married off was to provide them with an education. That is the single most important thing we can do to prevent child marriage in developing countries. So as a result, the rate of child marriage fell and the level of education for girls increased. Uh, one of the early girls we rescued just passed the bar exam, and she's just the first one in the pipeline. So the lesson is, it can be done.
That's Thank you, Olga, for that ray of hope. Um, I'd now like to turn toward the funding of this issue. And we have another poll for our audience. Out of the humer out of humanitarian response funds distributed in recent years, what percentage was spent on preventing gender-based violence against women and girls? Please use the YouTube chat box again to put in your answer. Less than 0.2%, less than 5%, less than 10%, or less than 25%. Thank you for participating. I'll let some more answers come in. Again, you might be surprised, but out of the $41.5 billion that were allocated for humanitarian funding from 2016 to 2018, less than 0.2% was spent on preventing gender-based violence against women and girls. And yet, women and girls are the most impacted by humanitarian crises. And while many funders overlook, overlook these critical needs, some step forward to fill the gaps where they can. The Isabel Allende Foundation supports and is a true funder partner of Global Fund for Women, as well as the Nepali Youth Foundation and Too Young to Wed. They step forward to fill gaps wherever they can in partnership with many other funders. But Lori, the way you support is so different. And I wonder if you can tell us, Lori, what the through line that connects all of these investments is for you and the foundation. Thank you, Renee. I'm really honored to be here with four women leaders that I adore and respect beyond measure. So thank you. Um, as Renee mentioned uh, earlier, at the, at mentioned just now at the foundation, we invest in the power of women and girls to support, to secure reproductive rights, economic independence, and freedom from violence. And so quite simply, if you look at it that way, Too Young to Wed, Nepal Youth and Global Fund for Women fit our mission perfectly. Check the all, they check all the boxes. Um, but it's way more than that when we're deciding um, which group to fund. It can be daunting and when, when, when we're figuring out how to, when I say we, it's Isabel Allende, myself and my associate, Sarah Hilsheim. And it can be daunting to figure out who to fund when there are, I think, like 1.5 million nonprofits in the U.S. alone and all of them in desperate need and more desperate since COVID. But these groups, believe me when I say, are extraordinary. Um, when we're considering where to give and what we do, um, we do our basic due diligence just like every other foundation, big or small. Um, but more importantly, um, we focus on who do we trust and believe in, who moves us deeply, uh, who do we want to have a relationship with, a long-term relationship with, and, and then we stick with them for years. We invest in people and issues that we can't stop thinking about. Um, and I've known these leaders, Sangeeta's newer to me, um, but I've known Stephanie and Olga intimately for years. I've been, we've been funding um, the Nepal Youth Foundation for 17 years and the same with the Global Fund for Women and uh, seven years for Too Young to Wed. And I watch them um, and I listen carefully to how they, how they do their work and, and how they get their feedback from the women on the ground and um, how they, you know, they, they're there they're not, they don't come in from the outside and impose their Western ideas on a group of people. They know the culture, they're in the culture, they live in the culture, they don't impose their way of doing things. They bear witness to the women, together they create communities, they create communication and positive movement forward. Um, it sounds like a lot of adjectives, but these women are, that you're looking at here today are truly courageous, selfless, they never tire, or if they do, they never complain about it. 
and they're about as egoless as one gets. Um, we give to these groups because um, I basically can't get the work they do out of my head and the way they accomplish how they how they create solutions for them. Um, and as you've heard, I'm not going to add a whole lot to what child marriage is, child marriages, but it fits most of the criteria for enslavement. Child brides are forced to work. They serve others under the threat of mental and physical punishment. They're dehumanized. They're treated as property. For me, if I care about women and girls, um, I can't ignore this issue of child brides. It's much bigger problem than I had ever imagined. And it completely takes away a girl's freedom, her education, her choice in life and her health. Um, I first became aware of this practice many years ago while I was on a solo adventure to Uzbekistan in 2000. And I was traveling in, in the village and I snapped this photo of this beautiful, sweet young girl holding her younger brother. And after I snapped the photo, she was very much like what you saw in Stephanie's video. She was whisked away in tears, screaming, holding on to her parents um, and put into a car um, with an older man. Her mom stood on the side, pushing her in the car, even though she was crying. And when I suggested to the person I was with that we intervene, he said, oh, she likes it. She has to cry so her family doesn't feel as though she's abandoning them or they have to know that she'll miss them. And at the time I had no idea, like I just could not even fathom it, that the man in the car was her groom and not her grandfather. So fast forward to 2008, um, and in my previous career before working at the foundation, which is such a gift, um, I was a graphic designer and I was working on a book called What Matters. And the story that we picked for What Matters was Stephanie's prize winning story about child brides. And I was laying out Stephanie's photos when I came across this photo you see now of the man um, of Afghanistan with the 11 year old girl and her groom who's in his 40s. I, I cannot, no matter what I do, erase this image from my brain. It is there. It has moved me to get off my butt and get out there and do whatever I can to support Stephanie and Olga's work to eradicate what I think is a crime. I mean, it's just really, I, I can't imagine my own daughter being taken away and married at, at 11 to a 50 year old man. And, um, and so what can I share with you about giving? That's, I guess that was the original question. <laughs> I would say, don't get daunted by the fear that you have only a little to give. Um, you can't really empty the ocean with a teaspoon, which is a phrase that Isabel uses all a lot, but um, just give what you can, know that your gift makes a difference and give to the issues that touch you, give to the issues that you can't get out of your head. And I think the important thing is to give now and give big, give until it hurts. All right. Well, I would love to turn to all of our panelists and um, something that struck me um, was, was the ray of hope that Lori and Olga have both shared. But Stephanie and Sangeeta, I would love if, if you could share with us something that gives you hope in especially these more difficult times um, when we experience setbacks. Sangeeta, if you would like to go first. During, during this pandemic, uh... Uh, no, I'm just thinking what would give us hopes. Uh, when I read news and when I talk to people in the Kagati village, I get negative news only. Uh, for example, uh, a few days ago, the uh, the couple we filmed in 2005-06, one of the couple, one of the uh, couples or one of the groom, he called me. To, he called me and he said, you know, my uh, sister's brother, sorry, my sister's son, he is uh, 18, 18 years old and 
he got married to a 17 years old girl. They, in fact, they eloped. Now, do you help me to hide this girl in your house for a few days? And I said, okay, what are you saying? You know, what message do you want to give? You yourself is a victim of child marriage. Now you are supporting that marriage and you are also want to, you also want to put me into problem because the legal age for marriage is 20 in Nepal, right? So the, the law, you know, the law says if, you know, those who arrange marriages, even those who participate in the party or those who go to a party or even the priest who arrange marriages, they would be jailed if, you know, if somebody complains to the police or complains to the authorities. So you want to put me into jail? That's what I said. So this is, I'm just giving you an example of the village, you know. Uh, so, but you know, when I went through the reports and when I talked to my friends, they say that, uh, yeah, there, there are some positive changes uh, taking place in the villages, in the rural areas that uh, girls are getting more educated. They are going to schools, they are going to colleges, you know, the marriageable is, is delayed. So, and, there are local NGOs working, five, six NGOs, you know, they are fighting. And like too young, too wait, we are also trying to intervene in the villas. That, that is our small effort, right? We are doing small things, but uh, we are hoping that it would uh, bring some changes in the villas. Uh, for example, we are uh, supporting, there, there are more girls than boys because girls are more vulnerable to child marriage than boys, though boys are also vulnerable. Uh, so last time when I visited the village, uh, you know, I saw uh, more girls studying in grade nine and 10. Earlier when we visited in village, Stephanie I, and I, we frequently visited the village and the school. So we, we would see less girls in the higher classes, higher grades. Now, you know, when I last time visited, I saw at least, you know, 15 to 20 girls in grade 10. And they said they, they want to pursue, you know, higher education if their parents support. Uh, so that's the, you know, little hope I saw in the village uh, because, you know, more and more girls are getting higher education and they want to continue their studies, though there are a lot of obstacles, they financial problems, you know, parents, wants to, parents want to get them married off, you know, though they are fighting and they want to continue their studies and they are more aware, you know. Uh, so that gives me a little hope, uh, you know, in the village as well as that is just an example that only represents Nepal, that village. Uh, so the, uh, and also uh, the marriageable is, legal age is 20 now. So that also, you know, at least scares parents, you know, they, they they are they are they don't dare to openly arrange marriage you know because of the laws there there were cases in last year i read in newspapers and uh, magazines that uh, few parents you know they were uh, the the father was a teacher but he arranged his son's wedding at the age of 18 and he hired a helicopter to get a bride uh, from the other village. So there was a huge show off, you know, helicopter landing in the village. Uh, so, but, and later, you know, being a teacher, he was not aware that, you know, they were arranging child marriage, but he was arrested later. You know, there was a complaint filed and he was arrested and the marriage was like uh, kind of uh, dismissed, you know, they were separated until 20, they get 20. So there are cases like that, you know, people are getting more and more uh, aware, you know, on the issues. And if somebody sees chil get chil children getting married, you know, they uh, complain, you know, the neighbor, even the neighbor are complaining. And I, and I, um, one of my friends who was writing on these issues, uh, she told me that in Kapil Vastu, there's some local NGOs working, they are training st uh, school students, girls, and they were, uh, and so when they have, they formed small groups of students. So if 
any of them knew if their friends are getting married or their parents are arranging, they go to the village and they go to parents to convince not to do so. You know? This kind of things are happening. So that gives me a little hope. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Thank you. I thank think you. sometimes the hardest part is, um, is, is the actual community change. Often it's, it's one thing to make the law that it's the age is 20. It's one thing to, to make people know that they shouldn't get married. Um, but then when you actually have the community accepting that and, and, and pushing back against the practice within their own communities, that's, that's when real change can really come about um, in time, of course. Stephanie, what gives you hope? A lot of things give me hope, actually. Um, I did share some, you know, pretty, pretty heavy stuff earlier, just because it's really been a tough year for girls um, and, and boys in some cases, too. But really, um, but really, I mean, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is, you know, Sangeet is very modest <laughs> because what we <laughs> first started going to that village. Like there were a lot of marriages underage. And um, and then th as we kept going over the years, we kept seeing that there were fewer and fewer marriages. And, you know, and then they started telling us, oh, they're all love marriages. And then even the ones that we were that were getting married, you know, the girls were much older. I mean, they're talking about a 17 year old girl. When I went, when we first started going, I mean, I, 17 is still young, but when we first started going, we were talking about 12 year olds and 13 year olds who are already pregnant. So I'm saying this is change in, in, you know, in a 15 year period. And there's no very few girls that are getting, getting married at those really young ages now. And so that's something to be very, you know, to be proud of change that's happening. And, and I credit the community with that because, you know, uh, they've asked for support and we've, we've, you know, we've supported them uh, the best we could. And we've been giving, you know, they've been very proactive about, letting us know which families the, the children will be vulnerable. And, uh, and then the people, the survivors who shared their stories have been local leaders and, and have been really trying to um, keep their own children from getting married as they've gotten older now too, because we've been there so long now that they've been, they've also been kind of uh, had, you know, we've watched them grow into, you know, their children grow into teenagers. And um, so, yeah, I think that there's a lot to be, it's, it feels, it feels daunting, but there's really a lot to be proud of and a lot to be hopeful for. We have had a setback over COVID, but um, it's not insurmountable and um, we just have to refocus and double and redouble our efforts and make sure that we prioritize this. And thanks to Lori and the Isabel Allende Foundation and all the amazing people who support our work and the other organizations here, Global Fund, the Paul Youth Foundation. I mean, you know, this is, this is, you know, change is happening. It, we will just want it to happen faster, but it's happening and we just have to kind of stay the course. Thank you all so much. I'd like to open it up to the audience for some questions. I think a couple have come in, but please do continue to send them in. Um, one question I'd like to ask is, um, uh, Stephanie and Lori, if, if you're funding in this area as well, um, what other countries deal with these issues without going into too much detail? I'll let Stephanie take that. Um, the, the areas where we're seeing kind of the, you know, Tiantwood focuses in uh, it, where it's most, the child marriage is mostly underreported and in areas where it's most egregious. So harder to reach areas. And so where we're seeing some of the most egregious areas are in conflict areas. We're looking at like Syria, Northern Nigeria, Yemen. I mean, Yemen has been through so much. All these areas have been through so much. So you're seeing very, very high rates of child marriage there because families are desperate. And then the other thing is, um, I think, and we see, we work a lot in Kenya and in the pastoralist areas, because those are areas where, while there's countries that they're like Kenya that have a lot of development and, uh, you know, and organizations working there, they're not working in these areas that are more nomadic and are having, they're harder to reach. And, and so that's kind of the, our priority areas for the moment. Thank you. Olga, I, I'm not sure how much you're working in that area. Do you have anything to add? 
I think um, what we're doing very, very well is providing girls with an education. Not one, not two, not 10, not a hundred, not a thousand, tens of thousands of girls. Uh, most of our, the beneficiaries of our program are girls. And uh, we are uh, taking great pains to see that they continue in school. And I feel that that's really the best, the best solution because uh, parents uh, hesitate and actually girls somewhat resist uh, being uh, married off if they are in school. Um, and I think one reason for the uh, spate of uh, child marriages uh, as a result of the pandemic is that schools have been closed in Nepal for a year and a half. And uh, girls in the ninth, 10th grade who can't attend school, their parents think, well, they're not going to school. We might as well marry them off. So our, our emphasis on girls' education, I think, is really the most effective thing that we can do in this area. Thank you. To build on that, um, Stephanie and Sangeeta, um, Olga has mentioned that one of the key tactics that she and Nepal Youth Foundation find the most um, impactful is education. What are some other strategies um, or that you all use and implement within the communities you work in? And how does education play into that? Um, so one of the things that it's, I agree that education is the single most protective factor against child marriage. However, um, I've also, you know, girls, the problem is, is that girls are very much valued by their bodies. They're valued for their fertility, for their sexuality and their labor. And so we need to change the conversation to have girls valued by their intellect, by their potential earnings, future, you know, and maybe not in Nepal, but in other areas, there's um, a dowry that must, you know, that, that people can also often get rid of their daughters to, and, and bring in uh, funds to their family. So there's, they've got to invest to, and wait for, you know, the decade or more that it'll take for that income to return to that family instead of it being, um, difficult. And so we are working on a safe space program now um, with uh, technical support from the Population Council about trying to bring uh, for girls in certain areas that are harder to reach. Um, sometimes it's just literacy if there's not a school there, but uh, literacy programs, but also the safe space program also is, is like a savings program. So it's giving them value now um, not just waiting until they're fully done with their education. So it's a savings program as an incentive. And it's also allowing, it's also allowing uh, the, it'll, it'll benefit the whole community because these girls will then be also learning during that time about reproductive health and rights. They'll be learning about, um, you know, financial literacy. And it's, it's a program that the girls meet at least once a week. And they're talking about all of these issues. Where are safe places? three people outside their family they can turn to if they feel in danger and a whole different curriculum that's that's out there that's tailored to the communities. So there's education, formal education. There's sometimes it's just literacy. Sometimes it's, um, you know, life skills education. And sometimes then there's the community education aspect too. Thank you. It's wonderful that you all are working in so many areas to bring about this change. Um, we talked to them about how change takes a long time. Um, what one question from the audience is: What is the timeline for making a real dent in this? Are we looking at decades? Um, what are we looking at? Well, we have been working in West Nepal with these bonded girls for twenty years. We helped to end the practice, but that wasn't the end because uh, we needed to see the girls were educated and. Uh, that they were not a burden to their families. So we, we have a major training program for these girls. They have started their own businesses. They have formed their own, we helped them form an NGO and is now one of the most powerful NGOs in the country. Thousands of returned girls uh, belong to it. And they have a micro lending program to help girls start businesses that is uh, really beyond the beyond. We gave them, I think $60,000 seven years ago to start this program, they've got over a million dollars now in the bank with an almost 100% um, uh, repayment rate. So we are empowering these girls. They are, many of these girls are now supporting the families 
that sent them away. It's very, it's very inspiring. They're very smart, very entrepreneurial, and uh, the training has been really effective. And we're still involved in that, actually. Thank you, Olga. Sounds like we're looking at decades. Um, yes. So you, you ended the practice of, of bonding in, in Nepal. Um, yes. 20, over 20 years um, in the making. Well, the, the, uh, legally, the government ended it in 2013, but then uh, we, we have stayed involved to be sure that the girls will be self-supporting and valued by their families. And uh, some of them are sensationally successful. I can't tell you. They started big businesses. They own hotels. They, they can do everything now. It's very inspiring. That's wonderful. Um, we have some more questions coming in, but I'd like to give Lori a chance to add in. Well, it's, I'm sort of dovetailing on what Olga said. I think as a, um, as a donor, it, in the beginning, I, you know, I came to this from a completely different career and I, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be quite honest, 20 years ago. Um, and I had heard all sorts of theories like, you know, you give for three years and then they're self-sufficient and they'll be fine after that. And I don't, I think, you know, like I said, we've been giving to Olga for 17 years and Stephanie since um, for seven and Global Fund for 17. And I think it's really important. And I say this because I think there are quite a few donors in the, in the audience. I think it's important to invest year after year, give to operate, find the group that you love, give to operating expenses. They have to pay the staff, keep on the lights, do everything they do. You know, don't, don't tell them what to do. Just give them the money and trust them to do what they do once you've decided that that's the group you want to fund and give because it's very sort of tempting and sort of interesting as a funder to think, I'm going to find 10 new groups this year and I'm going to do this research and I'm going to go here and there. But, um, you know, I, I just really feel like it's important to stick with it. And um, I just wanted to say one last thing about that is that it's a wonder, Isabel said to me, she said to add this to the end of the program, she said, it's a wonderful truth that the things we want in life, a sense of purpose, happiness, and hope are most easily attained by giving them to others. So. Thank you, Lori. That perfectly segues us. Um, in the last couple of minutes to close us out, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to share one nugget of wisdom or an action you want the audience to take away from this evening. And Lori, you already kicked us off. Um, so I will go next to um, Sangeeta. Uh, Stephanie, please, <laughs> you do it first. I'll think one line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I think that there's a lot of things that people can do. Um, I would say that I would say that there, you know, if you've seen interesting articles as Sangeeta has spoken about, you know, like we have, we, we do regular articles about them, you know, share them with people, you know, share this if it's available, when, when it's available with other people, have, um, you know, help people get passionate about this and, and connect with the issue. I think that that's um, really important. And, um, you know, Sangeeta, maybe you can talk about, you know, you know, the difference. I mean, you have a, you know, Sangeeta has a personal relationship with one of the children uh, that we have uh, supported over the years, you know, like how has that changed her life? Like how can just changing one life, you know, how, like, what does she want to do with her future now? Okay. You know, this is, this is a very personal thing. Uh, one of the children from the village, uh, you know, she lives with me. So I brought her and she is like my daughter. So she came in my house when she was 11. Now she is 15. So in the beginning, she didn't even know how to speak. Uh, you know, she was, you know, she could only speak uh, her, lo her uh, local language. And she, she was like, you know, she was like 11, but she could read and she was studying in grade two or three in the local village school, but she couldn't even write a sentence. But now, you know, when I look at her now, 
she is 15. She is uh, taller than me now. And she could speak fluently, you know, Nepali language now, you know, she is studying in grade seven. She has a dream to become a nurse. So, and she has learned so many things. So that gives me a hope. So I tell her, you should be an example to go later after you complete your studies, after you become a nurse or whatever you like to be, then you should go back to your village and encourage other girls. You should be an example. You know, you should go back to your village and work for the other girls. And she said, like, you know, she was peeping when, uh, when uh, that video was played. And that was in fact her uh, aunt's daughter. So, so when I went out, she said, oh, you know, Anita's video was played, she said. So I also showed her uh, your website, Too Young to uh, Wait's website, where her parents' pictures are published. You know, her, she, her picture, some, some of her pictures are also there. So she was quite surprised, you know, seeing her. She yesterday told me, is it me? She was asking because she couldn't recognize herself. Yes, it is you. She said, no, no, it's not me. And later, she closely looked at the picture and said, yes, it is me. Oh, I've changed a lot. She said that. So mm -hmm. that's a little hope. And the hope you and asked previously, I couldn't think about. And now it came in my mind. When I go back to the village, you know, those children who we filmed in 2005, six, you know, the couples or the children who got married when they were very young, like 12, 13, now all of them realize that, or they regret that they got married at early age and they spoil their career, their life, their future. And now they don't want to spoil their children's future. So they want their children to study more. And for example, the girl who is living with me, her father, one of the uh, groom we filmed in 2005, six, he says that he doesn't want her daughter to get married until 30. So until 30, and he wants to make her a doctor if it is possible. That's why he kept pushing me uh, since she was very uh, young to take her with me and give her good education. And Stephanie also supported a lot to her. So she's here and- Thank you. <laughs> it's so good that oh, oh, each individual- she, She's here now. She's just- Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, oh. Bitra, Bitra. Now Hello. She is. Namaste. 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 How she, she's taller than me now. Look. <laughs> Almost. See? <laughs> can, you, can you see us? <laughs> oh, so lovely. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. And so nice <laughs> to meet you. Olga, if you want to close us out with one nugget of wisdom. All right. My nugget of wisdom is when you help other people, you get more than you give. Uh, I have found throughout the last 30 years that I am repaid a thousand times over for everything we've done for these children. And um, now that I've been around for so long, the children that we picked up as beggars at a temple, absolutely no, no parents nothing, just sleeping on the street. Today, they came to live. We have uh, homes for children, one for boys, one for girls. They have now um, been through college. They're professionals. They have their own children. And I see that almost every day in Nepal. These kids who came to us desperate, desperately poor, not enough to eat. And now they're successful individuals contributing to society and raising wonderful families. And uh, that's the best thing I've ever done in my life. In my, in my 96 years, I think the last 35 years have been the best because of all the involvement I've had in Nepal over the years. Thank you so, so much, Olga. Yeah. Well, I have learned so much. And um, my top thing is that this is not insurmountable and that your actions can make a difference, whether it's giving till it hurts or helping one person, um, or bringing awareness to the issue by sharing tonight's event with others, um, or 
helping a, a young woman in your own home like Sangeeta. So thank you all so much. I would like to take a moment to thank the Commonwealth Club Asia Pacific Forum for hosting our for hosting tonight's gathering and share our deepest gratitude to our panelists, Sangeeta Lama, Stephanie Sinclair, Olga Murray, and Lori Barra for this engaging and incredibly thought-provoking conversation. And, and on behalf of all of us, thank you to our audience for joining us and giving us your Wednesday evening and for all of your thoughtful questions. Now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California in its 117th year of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>